Robert, you've been pretty much pushed through a grinder by the system. How do you think the system has treated you, your family, and your case? I think they've pretty much treated us as just cattle being herded through their slaughter machine. You know what I mean? I think that there's been no personal intervention as far as the appeals process or the trial. Like, nobody's ever bothered to step up and really consider the facts of the case or the facts surrounding my case or, or, or the mitigating issues in my trial to present a mitigating case during my trial. So I think it's all just been a, a more of a mechanical process to where you just put somebody on the conveyor belt and move them along. And uh, I think that's been the that's that's been the situation all along because there's a lot of issues in my case that ain't that that have never been heard, they've never been raised, they've never been put before the courts, before my trial courts or my appellate a, a, appeals courts. As a matter of fact, what's pending right now is a pro se motion that you drafted yourself. It wasn't drafted by your lawyers. You 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 sent it to the district court and they have passed it on the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals around the issue of misconduct and handling evidence in your case. The state withheld the evidence, with, withholding evidence, the prosecution, I mean, it's a number of things. I mean, for one, the vehicle that was used at the crime, according to the, to the district attorney's theory, well, bef when they found it, uh, it, well, when I got arrested about six months prior to me getting arrested, or a couple months prior to me getting arrested, they they had raided somebody's house for for car theft. People that it was, I guess, a, a group of people that were stealing vehicles. They raided their house, and they they actually found the license plates to that vehicle at their house. And they, according to my understanding, they questioned them about the, the, the this case about the Donna case. But that was never made known to my, to my defense team. We were never. I was made aware of that after I got here, through friends who knew those the, that group of people that were arrested and picked up and, and, and questioned about those license plates to that vehicle. Because that vehicle, one of the big issues in my case about the how they identified the vehicle was that it had paper plates. And when they when they raided these people's houses. They found the original plates to the truck, and they found paper plates that were blank that you could fill in yourself. Sure, sure yeah. The example, Dealer the, plates, yeah. Yes. And, um, well, these people, we, we don't know each other. I don't know who they are. To this day, I, I, I don't know who they are. I've never met them. I've never, we've never had any kind of contact. So that's one of the issues that, that, that the district attorney never gave to my defense team to question. We, we, we never were able to investigate that aspect of, of their theory because they never let us, they never gave it to us. They never gave us that information. So the, the, the police and the prosecutors knew about whereabouts of evidence to the vehicle used in the crime. Yes. But they did not share that with the defense team. That's a sculptory evidence. Yes. Uh, the defense team needs to know everything that they know in order to prepare an adequate yeah. defense. And, and, and what was your state of the mind at that point of the trial? Well, at, at the point of the trial, I was 19. I was, I, was, I was a young gangster, a gang member. You know, I had never been on trial for anything before. And, and, and you know, all my experiences with the with with the system have been in juvenile, you know, so in juvenile you don't really get no trial, none of that. It's just you go in front of the judge. It's a hearing. The judge tells you where you're it's going. Actually, you go. it's not even criminal court, it's civil yeah, stuff. Yeah, you just, you go where the judge tells you to go. So that was my experiences with the courts. So when I go to this trial, I'm, I'm kind of just sitting, I'm kind of just sitting there letting it take its course. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because it, this is the only way I've ever known. You know, I didn't, I didn't, come to understand all the appeals process and how you fight a case and case law and none of that till after I got here. You weren't mature enough, you weren't uh, uh, experienced enough to be much help to your defense anyway. Yeah. This is a process in which you were passive. Yeah, so I, I kind of just sat there and kind of expected my uh, my attorney to do his job, basically. And you didn't know, you know what that was. And, and I'm kind of just going along with whatever he says, assuming that he knows what he's doing, you know, because he's an attorney and I'm just, 
you know, I'm just straight off the streets, you know. <laughs> so I, I don't, I didn't really know too much about. I mean, I couldn't help him, you know. Yeah. I, I, I didn't know. I mean, I couldn't tell him where to go, how to look, how to investigate, what cases to look up. None of that to be of any help to him. So I kind of just sat there, you know. And and at the time, I was still kind of caught up in that mentality, you know what I mean? That 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 young thug mentality to where it was kind of kind of careless about the situation. Yeah, it's them over there and me over yeah. here, and I'm helpless. And 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 basically, you know, well, I mean, they're gonna get me anyway. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm already here. I'm already in jail. I'm already charged. They already got me locked up. So it's this is just a process that we go through. And at the end of it, they tell you where you're going and they send you, you know? And at the end of it, they send you. And that's road. kind of the way it went, you know? And they sent you here. And they sent me here. I've been on death row since December of 2003. There were other people in this case? There was people charged in the case because I'm here under a law of parties. So there's people charged. There was, there was people charged in this case. But I was the first one to go to trial. So the case was so weak, it's so circumstantial because there's no eyewitnesses. The only eyewitness that they had, his name was Coco. Well, that was his nickname. His name was Quintero. He testified at my trial and he was the sole, he was the, he was the, the state's sole eyewitness. He was to their the case. heavy hitter. And, and, and he testified in trial that it wasn't me who he saw shooting the guns because he was, he was about maybe, 15 yards away. So he watched the whole thing take place. So he, he said it wasn't me. So so the case is pretty much all circumstantial. So once they got me and they took me to trial and they sent, they convicted me, sent me to death row, they, they kind of just let every, they just kind of dropped everybody else's charges and left it at that, uh. you know? So there's, there's people that, whose charges got dropped because they had other cases so like one of my one of my one of the one of my co-defendants that was charged on this case, he had some robbery charges. So they just gave him a life sentence on that, dropped this case, and that was the end of that. In other words, you were the the revenge for the incident that you were, at best, a spectator. Yeah, and they 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 they, they got me. They dropped their charges, but it's, they had other charges. So they char they sentenced them for those cases, and that was the end of that. You know they. There's there's one guy that they're still looking for, and I've had a lot of problems. Like we hired an investigator to try to help my attorney go look up some records and stuff, like the stuff that I'm saying that they've been withholding, withholding this whole time. Okay, well, they won't give us none of that stuff because they're saying that it's still an open case because I have a, a, a fall partner, a co-defendant, who's never been caught. So this whole time, there's there's supposed to be. So they're still be, withholding evidence. There's still there's still stuff that they're not handing over because their excuse is that it's an open case, so they can't give it to us. Is that in your current motion? Uh, no, because I don't. I've never seen what they have, so I can't. I don't know what to ask for. I I don't know what to bring up because I've I've never seen the police reports. I've never seen because. Since it's an open case, like every three months, they have to give a report, an update yeah. on their investigation. Okay, well, that report has a bunch of other information that we try to get during my trial. Well, the DA was saying that we, 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 we should, the judge shouldn't grant us access to that, to that file because it's an open case. And it relates to and somebody else's case. Yes, and and, and since his excuse, his excuse was that since it's it's a gang related issue, that if if there's something in there, uh, I say say that they're getting close to arresting this guy, and I get the file, and we see something that I would tell them, so they're denying me access to any of the records based on that idea that. There might be something in there keep that I can go it. tell them. So they're trying to keep their investigation secret. And and that's keeping, I mean, we can't really do too much. Investigating on the, on the investigators' reports and their case because they won't give us access to it. 
And so here's the sorry state of American criminal justice. It's a patchwork quilt with so many parts missing that you don't ever get a full picture, and they've got an excuse for every missing part. And they try to cover they try to cover parts that they don't want you to see. You know, the quilt only covers what they want to cover. You know what I mean? That's true. And and that's the thing. Like in my case, they've never accused me of being the shooter. They, it's never been an issue that I took anybody's life. I said, but if anybody asked the district attorney who who was the party in the case, who who did he aid and abet in the commission of this crime to yeah. take these people's lives, they said, well, they don't know. So in my case, they don't know who pulled the trigger. They don't know who murdered the women. They're just saying that I helped them, but they don't know who I helped. And 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 that's been an issue in my in my case that it's it's, it's kind of been hard to raise it in appeal because they're saying, well, he was a party, and I'm I mean, how do I raise the issue of well, where's the party? Yeah, when. I don't, I don't know where their investigation is going. I don't know who they're naming as a party. I don't know who's, who they're alleging is the party because they won't give me access to their file. So if they have a list of the people that are a party to this crime, could be five people, 10 people, 20 people, I don't know because I can't look at their file to see who they're alleging was the party of the crime. On my way in here, I met your wife and her mother and three wonderful children. How have they been treated by this process? They kind of, you know, I mean, I've never had any attorneys really just try to get them involved in what's going on. You know, kind of my attorney's been kind of standoffish. So really their only dealings is with the prison system, you know, when they come here. And I mean, they've treated them all right, except I guess my only complaint is today, you know, <laughs> when it really matters that you would assume that they would be, <laughs> you know, more careful with what they're doing. It seems that they dropped the ball, you know. <laughs> it was supposed to have been visits yesterday that didn't happen? No, there was, I got my visits yesterday, which was a full day. I got my visits the day before, which were a full day. Today was a half day because of media day. Yeah. So visits run from, eight to 12. They didn't get in until 10. They didn't get here till 10 because the officer in the front told them that they're, they're not allowed to come see me today, that they either see me today and they can't see me tomorrow, or they see me tomorrow and they can't see me today. Where he got that idea, I don't know. But somebody pulled and got, got you in. I saw the warden and he said that he got, you, got them in at, at whatever time they came in. Yeah, as soon as they got here, they let them in. And they, instead of ending my visits at 12 the way they normally do, they let them stay till one. So I, I got about 30 minutes, 45 minutes extra. So you, you have learned how to defend yourself from other folks on death row. Yes, I've, there's people here who study the law. You know, there's people here who are actually very smart. And, and you know, they give me tips. They look here, look there, you know, and, and help me put stuff together. And then I have, friends in the free world who are also, you know, concerned because they know about the details of my case and, and the way my appeals have gone. So they're, it's, it's a patchwork. We're just patching stuff together. But it, but it seems that our, our arguments, <laughs> our paperwork is a lot more legit than what, what I've had with my attorney. Yeah. I, I, got a, I had an attorney in my federal writ. His name is uh, Don Rene. And I had some friends contacting him to try to help him with my clemency petition. And the man tells him, well, he's guilty anyway. What's the point? <laughs> and this is the man that's supposed to be helping me. So... I mean, I mean, and, and, and I see, I'm not a lawyer. Yeah. And I know what law of parties means. Yeah. Uh, and you just told me what was in your case file, in the testimony, in the trial. Yeah. And I don't know how any lawyer could conclude he's guilty anyway. That that just doesn't even make sense. Yeah, but but you know, I mean, now I've been asking, you know, because he has a lot of people on death row that he represents, at least eight or nine, and it seems that he does that frequently. <laughs> there's another, there's another guy that's on death row, that's on death watch right now. His date's on October 9th, and he told his friends the same thing. 
there's no point in doing clemency because he's guilty. I right? have one and reliable <laughs> audience for the radio show, and that's the guys on the road. Yeah. I mean, they will stretch speaker wire from hell and gone <laughs> to catch that show. And yeah. we got a repeater just a few blocks from here so that they can get a good signal. Yeah. Give that lawyer's name again. And uh, you fellas on the road, when you hear this name, if you got anything to say about this lawyers, shoot me a kite. Is that yeah. fair? Yes, sir. Because I ain't going to hit it. What because this because I, I, that's an that's issue I've, I've brought up to my friends that I, I, they keep assigning this man cases on death row, and he's not, he's doing patchwork. You see, he's filed people's briefs with my name on them, oh. on somebody else's. It's got my name, somebody else's Called arrest date. Call the word date. process or practice the law. And, and all he's doing is changing names and, and dates and refiling stuff. And his name is Don Rene. He's from New Mexico. And they keep assigning them cases, and it seems like, the, the dude does the same thing from what I've gathered. You know, he does the same thing with pretty much everybody he's helping. He was uh, Ross's attorney, too, and he just got executed. Yeah. And it was the same thing with him. You know, w w what's, what do you want a clemency petition for? If in Texas, they don't grant it. You know, I mean. Well, we interviewed Ross, and it was my impression that he didn't wouldn't much help in his own case because he was kind of out of it. Yeah. He had lost it. I don't know whether he lost it on the row or whether he'd never had it. <laughs> but you know, conditions on the road pretty bad. Yeah, yeah. You get, go crazy. You get in pretty it, bad. You? Yeah, they, you, you can. A lot of people lose it, you know. It's, I guess I've been fortunate to have my family and my kids and my wife and my, my life, you know. And, and I've had a good group of friends around me that kind of, you know, keep me focused. But not everybody's fortunate enough to have that, you know, and some people just. They, they lose it, you know? Well, I told you before the interview that I would looked over your filing. Yeah. And I thought there was a pretty good chance that this wasn't going to happen tomorrow. Yeah. But then I ain't in the system. I'm just an outside observer. You ready for this if it happens? Uh, well, I mean, I ain't really got no choice. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, if it happens, I can't stop it. I'm in a situation where I mean, I can't stop it. I can't. So, so mentally, I've accepted that, you know, that I, I, I know I'm on a conveyor belt, and I know the state of Texas doesn't have, it doesn't have no problem putting people to die, whether they're guilty or they're mentally retarded or they're innocent or, it's it's all it's all mechanical. If if there's a wrong word, on a filing that you file, something you file, that's enough for them, you know. It, it'll, it'll, they'll throw out the whole thing based on something that small. So I, I understand the way it works. So I, I guess mentally and spiritually, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm ready if it happens, you know. And uh, I just try to, what I've been trying to do is, is prepare my family because my family, you see, the, the, my family is, surrounds me so much and it's like I'm a pillar in my family now. I have my kids, my wife, my mother-in-law, my mom, my sister, my stepdad, and it's like for they've made me the center of their lives for all these years. Mm -hmm. And and really, that's my concern. My concern stopped being myself a long time ago because I, well, you know, finally I finally grew up and I started realizing that all these people are kind of. They're very emotionally attached to me, even though I'm not there. They 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 kind of gravitate towards me. And and that's really my main concern is trying to strengthen them, because I don't know how they're gonna take it. You know, I know it's gonna be hard for them, especially for my mom and my wife. Robert, the image you just patched together is the image I want, if I have to use this the world to remember about you. But if you've got a better thing that you want to say, that's your camera, look in it and say what you want to. I mean, that's that's basically it. I mean, the, the, the truth of the matter is that when I got here, I was, I was a young thug. I grew up on the streets. I was a gang member. I, my life was, was surrounded with negativity. But since I've been here, I've grown up, 
and 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 I've I've taken the time to 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 self analyze myself to get to know myself and who I became and how I became that person and not like that person because now I understand that that lifestyle is is not necessary you know a lot of us it's a trap a lot of us fall into that lifestyle without really knowing but once you 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 realize it i guess that's where you have the choice to either change it or stay in it and i made the choice to leave that behind and become a better person it's understanding that it might not be much in this process that i'm going through you know like clemency it doesn't do no good for that because they don't even consider it but it's but I, I did it because it's the right thing to do and for my family. And, and, and I'm not the same person I was when I first got here. And for the jury to say that we can't change 11 years ago is just wrong. Because, if, proved it. because if they see me today, it, it be, I, I'm sure after talk, if they just gave me a chance to talk to them, I'm sure their opinion would change. Robert Garza, thank you very much for committing this interview.